Okay. So if, um, if you're curious about this uh, slide deck, um, it's going to be a bit longish. We are not going to discuss it that, that long, but we, we have these slides available for you because they contain lots of uh, resources that may be useful, uh, lots of pointers, lots of uh, references. So you can go just to the link below, bit.ly slash HCLA slides, and can be useful for the during the workshop or afterwards, if you find them um, useful. So uh, gathering today online uh, with this aim, which is consolidating the so community or what we consider is, is already consolidating as a sub-community of learning analytics researchers and practitioners who are interested on human factors related to the development of um, learning analytics innovations. So um, we have we plan to address these questions um, to some extent today. Uh, it's a short workshop, so we are going to try to touch base on, on these three things, which is um, trying to generate some common ground in, on what has been done so far in this area, and ha also highlighting these uh, fuzzy concepts like participatory or human-centeredness um, that we can sometimes use um, very thinly without understanding that there is a strong community behind each of these terms. Co-design is, is another one. Um, and, and also try to, it's going to be challenging in three hours, but it would be good to hear everyone's voices um, regarding a potential research agenda as a community or um, intentions that the community should aim for. So in our individual work, we can generate that synergy. Um, these are the workshop organizers. This is a long list because uh, we try to acknowledge um, all the people, and not everyone is included here. We know all the people who have been doing human centered learning analytics um, in recent years. But um, this is a, a group of people who have been trying to push this agenda forward. And, and some of you um, who, who are participating, uh, we know that you have been doing it uh, as well because we. we run a survey and we, and we know your, your work as well. So maybe in the next um, lag, hopefully if it is um, face to face, we can have a larger, uh, a longer workshop and maybe other people can, can also contribute to organization. So I just want to thank as well to, to the other organizers. Um, and this is uh, not a comprehensive list because we have some last minute additions um, of, of you, you people who are participating, thank you so much for um, supporting and, and also for the interest in the topic. And what is really um, good to see is the diversity of institutions, um, continents, countries, um, and also we will learn that we're coming from different backgrounds uh, in, in terms of research. Um, this is the agenda for today. It's a short workshop. Um, so it's going to be intensive. We are going to start with some introductions, which is what we're doing at the moment, and then a small overview of human-centered learning analytics, um, which I was mentioning um, in this slide deck. You can find some resources. It's not comprehensive, but it can be a good start if, if you are new in, in this area. Um, or it can be just a good reference if you already know uh, deeply about human-centered design and and the, the intersection with learning analytics. Then we are going to have a human-centered design challenge. We are going to break into four groups. And the objective is to work on a fictional scenario. But in doing that, the objective is to trigger conversations around what things we need to consider in our own research um, if we want to embrace human-centered human-centeredness approach uh, for designing. So I don't worry too much about the final outcome, but it will be good to, to have those conversations in those small groups. And then we're going to do a, a, a sharing and a guided critique um, of those design plans. We're just going to, to have a design plan, which is uh, it's going to be in a Google Doc. Um, and then we're going to finalize with some discussion, hopefully addressing this intention of planning for the future, what can we do as a small community. Um, we're going to be open the microphone for everyone to, to contribute with any idea 
Um, everything's gonna be uh, relaxed today. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna then pass the microphone to Juan, who is going to give us an overview of what we found out in the survey that we ran for those who who um, who, who received it there beforehand. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Roberto. I'm Juan Pablo Sarmiento. I'm uh, from NYU University uh, Learning Analytics uh, Research Network. I'm a PhD student there. And um, so uh, thank you so much for everybody who answered the survey. I'll try to go quickly because Roberto has a great presentation coming, coming uh, up. Um, but um, kind of as a big overview, I think this is a great, great learning community for, for us to have at this workshop uh, in the sense that we have um, we kind of like run the gambit. There's, uh, there's professors, researchers, data scientists, students, um, and, and kind of like evenly split. So there's a lot that we can learn from each other. And there's a lot of different ways in which we can bring different perspectives on the, on the groups uh, once we're working together. Similarly, um, there's a lot of us in the room who have had experience with, uh, with uh, human-centered design, about 75%, um, out of which... Uh, about half actually have had experience in, 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 a, in a bunch of projects and about one quarter of that is new to this. So great space for them to learn and great space for just, you know, sharing, um, sharing information uh, amongst us. Um, out of the 75 who had some experience with uh, human centered design, about two thirds, so like 50% of us actually um, have, have had that in within learning analytics. So um, that's a lot uh, given that it's kind of like a, uh, a methodology that is sort of new to our to our uh, field and um, and also it's you know like, again like this has been used in all sorts of different places you know MOOCs full improvement computer support collaborative collaborative learning lots of ideas coming here uh, could you could you go on to the next slide Roberto thank you um, <clears throat> yeah so what brought us here um, Understandably, a lot of people have interest in bringing human-centered design into uh, their, their processes, their projects. Uh, there were a couple of theses uh, of PhD students that want to incorporate that as part of the methodology. Some of us want to develop theory and kind of like go to a better understanding within our community about what human-centered design uh, is. And, and uh, Roberto is very much going to talk about kind of like those fuzzy terms and kind of how we can start moving towards reaching an agreement of what many of these things mean. Um, and uh, obviously also just kind of like better understanding what, what, what this thing about human-centered design um, is in general. Um, could we go to the next slide? So uh, our sub-community here on the room, uh, we, we asked you guys also to kind of define what human-centered design was. Um, many of you kind of talked about it as designing for humans with humans, uh, using that, that idea. Um, it was also interesting that a lot of the, uh, the, of the of the way that people refer to it could be said that it was from uh, saying, you know, that it was from a pragmatic standpoint, that you, the, the reasons why we use human-centered design, um, you know, like asking the opinions of users to incorporate them into the designs, to have better designs, um, have a more sophisticated understanding and models of our users to, to make the tools that we make are better. But uh, also we had some representation of uh, certain approaches that can be called emancipatory, um, you know, kind of like the idea that the, we do a human-centered design because uh, we believe that humans should be part of the process. That it's that that, that you know this is um, uh, a space where we are using power and 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 a thus you know like it's it's delicate if we do it without actually asking them who will be impacted by uh, the tools that we create. Um, and you know why human-centered design? Understandable. We want to understand the stakeholders, the context, the user needs, the potential uses of the systems to generate ideas and. Uh, Somebody put for political reasons, which I think is just fascinating. I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, but uh, um, I, I would love to hear you know like um, <clears throat> more about that in uh, as we go through the workshop. Um, next slide. Um, uh, Roberto, could you? Ooh, I think uh, Roberto might have fallen. Okay, don't worry. I'll present. Give me a second. Uh -huh. That is not what I wanted to do. Sorry. I'm sorry, Dorito might be having some trouble with uh, with his internet. So, um, 
The other thing I thought was super interesting is that the approaches that are being used that are kind of present in, in, in you guys in the room, like run the gambit from um, user-centered design approaches to inter integrative learning design, participatory design, co-design, um, many of the tools that, that are usually used as part of uh, participatory design and co-design have at least one person here who have tried them, uh, scenario storyboards, paper prototypes, um, contextual inquiry, so, um, so again, it's a, it's a great, great opportunity to kind of share these ideas. Uh, we will be sharing some tools that can help you um, scaffold the knowledge if you don't, if you're kind of unfamiliar with some of these terms. But uh, also, you know, feel free to just ask around in the, in the teams, in your small groups. Uh, there might be somebody who actually has tried one of these things or is familiar with, uh, with them. Um, the other final thing that's, uh, I think, a great resource is uh, that you guys shared, uh, we're generous with sharing some of the um, kind of cool uh, resources that are out there to use for participatory design. Um, so when, once you have the presentation, you'll have these you know, toolkits, books, um, and uh, those uh, two pages, the designkit.org from, uh, from IDEO um, and uh, Design Lab from uh, USDSD, already have you know, a lot of resources that are free um, to, to start you know, trying, trying new things. Okay, um, so is Roberto back? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, I will stop presenting. Okay. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> what happens again? Someone just take over. You know, it's the beauty of me. <laughs> um, we were just talking about that this could happen. So, yes. uh, um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Let's see it here. Okay. It's Thursday. So let's go through a, a short overview of. Um, the current works. Um, I'm going to go relatively fast because the purpose is not to, uh, is not tutorial, is not to, for this to be a tutorial. So you can just check the slides in this link um, again if you are curious and it can be useful to have it handy uh, for the later activity. So um, why, why are we um, pushing for this idea of bringing human-centered design uh, methods into learning analytics? There is a very interesting paper uh, by Christy Quito, Simon Bokham Schoen, who's in the room, and Andrew Gibson, where they were describing that we make several mistakes in learning analytics, in several learning analytics projects. And one of them is um, sometimes to uh, measure what is not really relevant from an educational point of view. So we end up um, uh, looking at things that are irrelevant and also not acknowledging that what the data we can capture is, is commonly incomplete. We don't capture everything that is happening because learning is, is really complex. And um, this is aligned with Biesta's concern about this trend on uh, evidence-based education. Um, and Biesta proposes uh, value-based education, which is um, that the role of the evidence that we can collect should be subordinated to the values of the educational practice. So we are talking about about the values of the human, the humans that are behind education, which are all the stakeholders, but particularly educators and learners. Um, and also, Brian Gasevich and colleagues um, propose a very simple but very um, insightful model for the field of learning analytics, where they have theory in data science, but also design. And in this paper, um, they propose that the most effective results um, are the ones that are based on principles from these three dimensions. And design is not necessarily something that explicitly is in the conversation in most, most papers and more, more in many circles of learning analytics. We put a lot of effort on uh, linking educational theory and data science and the, 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 and the models uh, which is really important because there are two pillars, but design is also a third one which we shouldn't forget. And learning analytics should be a, a, an intersection. Um, there is also um, emerging interest in human centered learning analytics. Actually, in uh, LAC 2018, the main conference theme was towards user centered analytics. However, we will talk about these differences in terms, uh, because the words are, are really important. So what is human? Um, there is a, 
um, a way to that we can define human centeredness, um, which um, this human centeredness has been identified in other fields. Uh, it is about understanding who are critical stakeholders, the relationships, and the context. Uh, um, the term itself contains already lots of meaning. We are not talking about placing the human in the middle or in the center. It's about understanding uh, the human factors, but also the social factors and the technology factors. It's different to, to human-centric, where all the humans in the center and everything is around it. It's more about an ecological view of, of the system. And in this case, we're talking about educational system. So if we go into the literature about human-centered design and economics, um, human centeredness has been defined as um, a way to enable individual and cultural conceptions to unfold into the interfaces with technology. So it's not necessarily about the design of the interfaces, but embedding the cultural factors into them, into the, into the interface with the technology. <clears throat> so we are talking about both the human and technology side, but just about designing the technology itself, but also the practices around their use. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, very interesting paper I would recommend um, for everyone to, to have a look at least um, by Sanderson's papers. It's a very foundational paper that explains what is co-creation, what is co-design, and, and they propose this, this landscape. And there are a few terms here. It's not comprehensive. There are many other um, areas related with humans and their design. So both, it's very interesting because they define this quadrant. So at the top and the bottom, we have the intention, which is leading the project or the innovation by research to understand something or by design, which is um, to, to design something. Um, and all the different terms are spread in, in the quadrant as well from the left to the, to the right. So we have one conception, which is understand that the user is a subject on the left. So on that side, we, we start having user-centered design. So user-centered design in LAC was, was, had that tendency towards the left, which is looking at the user or the learner or the educator as a, as a subject. And we, we have uh, some methodologies there, like usability testing, user-centered design, using props to design um, interfaces. And then the right is different conception, which is uh, looking at the user as a partner. So in, in that side, we have um, participatory design research, the Scandinavian, um, uh, the Scandinavian uh, discipline or community that originate, where participatory design originated from. And, but we also can also have co-design or the use of generative tools. We're going to mention them later on. And it's very interesting just to understand that, that each methodology can have a whole community behind them and, and a whole history of development. So in a, a simplified way um, proposed by these authors uh, about designing, uh, they, they talk about this kind of fussy uh, way to design, starting with a fussy, front end of interaction with technology, and then uh, conveying into an actual product at the end. So that's uh, how ideally would work, right? With some ideas, then narrowing down into concept prototypes and the actual product. Um, we're go going to come back to this line. Um, and, and this, uh, they also say user-centered design is different from um, human-centered design or co-designing. User-centered design is something that we, we usually do as researchers. We look at the user, imagine it's the learner. We bring some theory, hopefully educational theory. We gain some insights, and then we report back in the form of papers. So we, we, we tell the designer to do something, or we sometimes are the designers ourselves. But if we, um, so this is what we usually do. We have final evaluation with teachers and students once the prototype is, is done. Or sometimes we have some initial consultation with teachers and students. This is fine, it's user-centered design, but it's not necessarily looking at uh, them as partners. It's not necessarily co-design. 
or co-creation. So because co-design and co-creation is about uh, bringing the users or the stakeholders at the same level with the designers and the researchers. So they are going to bring some their own expertise in, on the table. And that can be challenging for many. Um, some of the arguments that I heard several times is that the, the students are not experts. Um, however, they are experts in, the, in, in some things like their own learning and their own experience. So they, they are the only ones who have that experience. So that, that, that should be acknowledged. So when we uh, go back into this policy way to design, um, we, we can have the stakeholders involvement in this process, a co-creation at the beginning, but also consultation during the implementation and evaluation at the end. So the role of the student can be as a collaborator at the, at the beginning and then just keeping their voice uh, towards the whole project. This is an idea that um, Carlos and, 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 and myself and, and uh, Teresa, we put together as a conceptualization, bringing the idea of design thinking um, to, for co-designing and, and giving a voice to the teacher and the learner and the, the whole process. Design thinking is one of the um, uh, very interesting ways for designing. I have a link, uh, we included a link there in the title. If you're interested and you look at the slide, you can click there. It explains what, what design thinking is. And I'm sure you, many of you are already familiarized with, with the techniques. Um, so uh, let's look at the present. That was human center ness in general. Let's look at what works have been done, applying some of those techniques into learn analytics. So it's going to be a quick um, overview. So there is some sort of definition of what human center learn analytics is. Um, uh, and Rebecca Ferguson and myself we put together a special issue on, on this topic. And that special issue has some um, vision. Um, but I'm going to summarize the insights from, from this special issue um, in five points. The first one is um, that learning is complex, and, uh, and that's the first step um, that can motivate us to embrace this kind of methods because to embrace that complexity, we need to understand that teachers and learners may have more needs than data needs. So if we just focus on the data needs, it may be easy to provide a solution, but acknowledging that that's not going to solve the problems is a first good step. Um, many uh, current tools and dashboards we use, we, we hear that, that uh, word many times, many times require a level of data literacy. So um, maybe the question is, if we are putting in the hands of of people the right tools. So we need to train the user to use the tool from a human center perspective. It's a question that we just need to ask us at the beginning if, if data literacy is the solution or maybe a, a better design of the tools. Um, because um, <clears throat> students are, and, and, and also teachers, although teachers may, may have other kinds of literacies, but, but, but they are not data experts. So if we are going to work with data, we need to just really acknowledge that they are not necessarily data experts, especially students. And the students can also not be trained for using a tool because they are just going to be temporary, temporal users and we cannot keep training them. So we need to think about the adapting the tools to their current practices. And this is documented. Um, there's a, this interesting paper on data visualization. This is just data visualization literacy, very simple. Um, a survey that was run by these researchers just asking a higher education STEM students if they could understand the visualizations that their teachers were showing to them um, on, on slides. And, and then they could understand even those visualizations. So imagine uh, putting a dashboard in front of them with, with visualizations about their own work. It's, we can expect that it's, it's a challenge. And these were STEM students. Um, and the fourth point is that involving stakeholders may initially be perceived as difficult and definitely is more time consuming and require energy and resources. But in the end, uh, it, it can pay off. So there's a whole uh, discussion about uh, adoption in this point. And 
um, there is a paper that was uh, proposed um, to, to bring all these different stakeholders into the table um, by using metaphor orchestration um, to support inter-stakeholder communication. I just drop it here in case you are interested as well. Uh, and the last point is um, uh, uh, that, that ethics is a burning topic in learning analytics, but probably human-centered design approaches can be a way to address some of them because the idea is to open the, the microphone for the stakeholders to, to give an input on their, on their um, ideas about uh, potential surveillance or uh, ethical issues that, that are related with the practices around the technology. So that can be another way to, to address some of those uh, concerns. So um, there's this very interesting paper um, related to the idea of uh, ethics and learn analytics by Pierre Chuniking. Um, that was there. He's coming from CSCR community, different community, um, but there are some overlaps already with learn analytics and. And he was discussing about that learners are not to be seen as passive beneficiaries of a superior control entity. And they, he doesn't necessarily explicitly talk about human-centered design, but it's implicitly we can make the association. So if learn analytics have to play a role, it should be limited to one of awareness and recommendation, but we can argue that we can let the learner also to decide um, how, how they can appropriate the, the tools that they are that they can use. Um, and the special issue that I was mentioning before, um, there, there is um, a strong focus on teachers, not, not that much on learners, but some other authors have been working with learners. So I'm just going to highlight three out of the six papers that are in this special issue. Um, one is um, uh, summarizing the work by Ken Holstein, uh, who probably is in the in the room, um, who was one of the the pioneers of bringing several tools for human-centered design um, to to create this uh, augmented reality uh, monitoring tool for teachers using several techniques, uh, lots of generative tools, tools for aviation to let teachers to, to dream pretty much. I want this, this tool and, and the, these are called usually gener generative tools. There's another paper by Alicia Weiss and John G. Jung, um, very foundational that bring also into the conversation the idea of that we need to understand um, the sense making and the, the decision making processes into the conversation for, of designing for, for teachers. Um, so it's very, very foundational. We highly recommend the paper. Um, there's another very interesting paper that looks at the, how we can solve certain problems by giving the, a voice to teachers. So um, these uh, authors um, propose that at a faculty level, they can uh, enable teachers to um, create, identify questions and submit proposals for using, exploiting the data, and then the development team can realize those ideas. So it is very interesting um, process at a, at a macro level of, well, a macro level of a, of a faculty or institution. There are other works that um, are, are there. This one. Um, a previous work where the idea is to um, create low fidelity prototypes before doing deployments. That's also very basic um, practice and have as, as, as a circle, as a iterative process. We also have um, Bodon Chang's uh, paper, paper on bringing value sensitive design. Value sensitive design is another um, group of methodologies, uh, methodology itself. I have a link at uh, the bottom, if you're interested, uh, from uh, the Value Sensitive Design uh, Research Group. And I think the co-author is from that, that team as well, um, where they have uh, many, many sub-techniques to understand the values of the stakeholders and embed those values into design. This is really very interesting um, body of knowledge and, and techniques for designing for the, for understanding the values and embedding 
y varias en el design. Um, in, in, in Learn Analytics, also, um, Carlos, who is also organizer of this workshop, um, brought different techniques uh, from human-centered design disciplines, like the user journeys, into an uh, educational context and create some interesting tools. This is uh, one example um, to co-create the, the journeys with, with, with the students. So they would explain, oh, if I'm in the classroom, I usually have problems here. Or I would, if I, there is a learning analytics tool, it would be good to have them have them here in this position, this physical position with this information. Um, and he also proposed the LAD LADEC, which is um, learn analytics design cards, um, which uh, design cards are very useful. This other work by, by um, our colleagues from NYU, also organizers of the workshop, who have been using cards and other techniques to co-design learn analytics with, with students. So pretty much the students are getting the attention as well in different works. And I would highly recommend you to, to watch the solar webinar by Alicia Weiss. Um, and the link is, is here. Very, very interesting. Uh, similar perspective. You want an expanded view of um, human-centered design. Um, and there are other authors there. We couldn't put all of them in here, but we added some in, in this slide just for you to be aware, um, if you're interested, of course. So that's, that's it uh, for this. Quick overview. I hope it was useful and not too boring. Um, and let, let's see. Well, let's ask Fabio if he's sleeping already. <laughs> so we are going to have now the design challenge. Um, uh, but um, I'm going to stop now. And maybe if there is any burning question, we'll be good to have a quick discussion. No. Um, okay, I just check in the, the chat if there's any. Any question? Good. Lots of resources uh, being shared on the chat. Awesome. Yeah, and, th and, and my apologies if I, I miss anyone's work. I'm aware of some others we couldn't include. Um, it was just a brief overview. Okay, so if there are no other question, um, yeah, Fabio, um, do you want to, to say something or should I just uh, continue? Uh, no, for the design challenge, if you could introduce it, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good, uh, okay, so we are going to, to go into breakout rooms, but before we go that, we go there, um, Let's go through the instructions. Uh, everything is crystal clear. If anyone has a, a question, please ask. I've been in other breakout rooms, and then I go to the breakout room, and I don't know what to do. So the idea now is to have that clear. Uh, so you and your small team, we are going to have random teams. Um, we'll engage in creating a, what we call a design plan. It's not an official term. So it is just um, a, a checklist of what we would ideally do if we would be in a project. Imagine that it's in your own institution. Um, I know that not everyone is in a higher education institution, but we try to, to make it an institutional little project. Um, in trying to embrace human-centered methodologies, um, you will be provided with that design challenge, and that challenge looks like this. It's gonna be there in your Google Doc, if everything works well. <laughs> so the problem is um, at a, higher institutional administration level. So you are in a learning analytics team and you're asked to create a solution that enables educational decision makers, um, including the educators, to monitor what is called as engagement. And maybe you're familiarized with that word in different ways. So um, across different courses or, or, or subjects. Um, and then you will you will be able to read the rest of the of the, the challenge. So they are asking for a tool and to identify disengaged students and then help them. So it's one of um, a bit classic issues, but there is going to be an interface also for students. So it's, there's a little bit of complexity there. 
Um, so please work together um, and try to put together a, a, a human-centered design project. So the administration is not asking you to do that, so you need to convince them. Um, so consider methodologies such as value sensitive design, co-design, the use of generative tools, um, in planning those projects. Uh, if you don't know about these tools, we have some resources, uh, additional resources in the um, in, in the document we are providing. There's another extra slider that Juan kindly prepared with other information about these kind of methods. Um, so fill the items to, to the template, keep, keep the time awareness, and there's going to be 55 minutes to do that, and then we're going to come back and share and, and, and try to complete it um, as much as you can. That can emerge. So I don't know if anyone has any question before we... Just as a very quick anecdote, sorry. Um, I know that JP, JP, I'm putting you in the spot, um, spent much more time convincing NYU's officials in the IT department about the process for developing a student-facing learning analytics tool than running the workshop, per se. Actually, perhaps the same time, but it took a long time to create a document and come up with a process of, of uh, user-centered design with a rationale that made sense and could convince IT. So this is what we want from you here. Uh, we're not creating a tool. We're not jumping into a design platform and creating something. We're not the visual designers here. We're planning the process and creating the rationale. Uh, what we're doing, what is the process, what is the theory behind, what justifies each step, what justifies each methodological block here, okay? And then after this 55 minutes that I'm not gonna rob from you, uh, we're gonna go into a, a sharing and guided critique method uh, moment where we'll do a 360 degrees uh, critique. So try to write uh, or think about as much as you can, okay? Okay, do you see the big synthesize slide in front of you? Yes. Um, you see it, Google Doc. Mm, okay. HTLA challenge specifications document. That's what we see. It's, it's another one of your file screens, Fabio. Yeah, too many screens. But anyways, so let's just uh, share two minutes per group. What did you learn by looking into other groups' uh, work? Would you pick up another approach or would you ask other questions? What did you notice? Uh, group one, you have the floor. No one from group one. I think that's our, that's our group. Uh, sorry, I used to use it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we got to uh, so not to the agreement and it's really hard to define what it is engagement on our side. So yeah, some proposals are that maybe we don't want to work with engagement, but focus on disengagement which may lead to more action. Uh, maybe it's easier to measure who is not there than who is actually doing more. Um, so we try to refocus that on our project and say um, that maybe uh, we need more work in defining what is the issue and spend more time in um, doing focus with more interviews maybe with teachers and students and, and see uh, where we should put the effort. Thanks. Someone from group two, what did you guys learn?
calling the shy members of group number two. There may be a confusion because I think the documents have a number and the, the, the breakout rooms have a different number. So people might be confused and maybe group two is not aware that they are group two. So now that JP yeah. started talking, <laughs> JP, <laughs> perhaps you could synthesize your group. Um, so not, okay, I'll, I'll synthesize. Uh, it's group three, but whatever, uh, uh, um, I think. <laughs> um, and um, everybody, you know, feel free to kind of come in. Um, it was, as, as expected from human-centered uh, learning analytics, there was a lot of, like, discussion. Um, and, and uh, you know, kind of a lot of, the, there was a need of kind of bringing together some of the constructs similar to kind of what, what Carlos was saying. Um, I think, in fact, uh, through the through the gallery walk, uh, one thing that kind of struck us is that other people were having this similar discussions, like, you know, what is, what is engagement? Um, one question that seemed very interesting, and I think somebody else remarked on this, is, you know, sometimes we should ask, what is the question be beyond the question, right? You know, like if, if, if somebody says, we want to know the engagement of the students uh, for whatever, higher, it's like, okay, but what, what is truly their pain point, you know, that is actually behind their need? Um, and, um, and that might, might help us kind of like to move uh, away from, from some of these constructs, constructs that are like ill-defined and then we just keep on using without really knowing uh, what, 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 what they might mean. Um, and kind of like one thing that we talked about it a lot is kind of who should we be talking um, and, and how to access them and what tools um, can, we, can we use, can we leverage um, in human-centered design to, to bring some of those important voices uh, in, into the conversation. I don't know, Lou, am I, am I reflecting some of the, am I reflecting the thinking uh, and, and what might, might I be missing? Yeah, I think that's good. We had, I mean, those are like the main points. We had some good discussions about things like, um, I'm thinking before the break even, um, you know, maintaining these solutions. What does it look like for scalability? Um, we talked about issues like what happens if, how do we design with users who might not know actually what they need and different methods and tools to approach that. And we had some good, interesting discussions around those. Uh, Ken, why don't you summarize group four and then the other group is the other group. No one knows who's group two so far. So it, it will become evident. Yeah, I'm excited to learn who the mystery group is. Um, <laughs> so we, we uh, talked a lot, lots of parallels with other groups um, around how engagement is defined, but we also talked a little bit about um, whose vision is this really that what we need, what we really need is a tool to measure engagement. Um, is this an assumption that the administrators are asking, uh, are, are making? So we talked a bit about trying to interrogate some of those assumptions, maybe asking what is the real problem that cause the administrators are essentially asking for a particular solution. Um, but then assuming that if we were to, so this form part of the research plan, speaking with various stakeholders, um, instructors, students, um, in addition to administrators to try to understand um, whether they view uh, measuring engagement as, as the right direction to be going um, through a variety of approaches. Um, uh, and then if the answer turns out to be yes, or at least yes in part, maybe there's interest in measuring engagement, but there's also interest in many, many other things um, that we could address as part of that package. Uh, then we get into how is engagement defined. So we talked a little bit about um, kind of contextual or context sensitive measures of engagement, trying to think about um, what, act, what sorts of actions uh, these analytics might inform. Um, but then we started to talk uh, a, a lot about d does this process need to necessarily result in a dashboard? Um, and uh, Roderick, who's, uh, who had to leave, unfortunately, a little early, um, expressed that, he, I guess, worries that uh, at the end of the day, um, a lot of these sorts of projects, it seems almost inevitable that they will end in a dashboard. Um, so we talked about maybe taking an explicit stance and thinking about how might we design possibilities that go beyond surveillance or more administrative uses of data? How might we... Um, 
explore uh, alternatives to dashboards, um, including, for example, giving uh, learners more agency and constructing data stories about their own paths um, and so forth. Just to complement very quickly, you were also talking about the, some of the ethical limitations of uh, the idea of engagement versus disengagement and the way it might be shown to students and instructors might not be the most ethical. So this should be at least a consideration in, uh, when designing uh, the non-dashboard because our group is the non-dashboard group. Uh, group two. What do you guys have to say? Okay, so um, I will now open the floor. We don't have much time, so Roberto, I will can we do 10 minutes for open floor uh, and just discuss a little bit the, the, the task, how it was constructed, what we uh, saw as group or as workshop organizers, but also uh, opening the floor to everyone else to like, just comment, impressions, questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Open microphone for anyone to comment on the challenge. Yeah. What, what do you think? Uh, sorry, I, I was a bit confused about which group we 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 we, we were. Uh, as someone mentioned earlier, that the phone numbering and the breakout room numbering is different. But I, I just wanted to share a very interesting point that we discussed actually in the last few minutes before we got kicked out of our breakout session. Um, so. What engagement means was definitely something we talked about the most. Um, and we re then realized that we actually then started to talk about the messages that we received from Zoom sensors. And we then we realized that even for the same stakeholder groups, say for students, you will still perceive engagement differently. Whatever we did, say survey focus groups understand how students or what, how teachers or, or how managers may perceive engagement, but even for the same stakeholder groups, it's different. So like we, we then started to talk about how Zoom sensor perceived engagement, which quite clear to us was based on how much you talk. Doesn't matter what you talk about, as long as you talk. <laughs> and, um, and then we then talk about the importance of feedback that uh, teachers give to students based on this kind of analytics um, data. Um, and we realized that you can never really capture the full picture. Um, you, you could only give people a glimpse of what might be happening, but you can never be 100% sure. So the feedback is actually quite important that the teacher is not passing on judgments just based on whatever they see from the dashboard. Instead, just always try to be encouraged and say, hey, I noticed that you are not engaging. Uh, oh, oh, maybe, sorry, that's even judge, judgmental. Maybe just a stable, something like encourage, encouraging to say, hey, we, we are doing this and uh, most students have visited this. And, and what do you think about this particular uh, topic that we were discussing. Yeah, so just in a way encouraging rather than say, you definitely have to, to turn yourself to fit into those categories of lenders that we have identified as features of engagement. Yeah. One thing I noticed is that not many of us could actually envision a design process, um, which for me is, is, is a positive thing. Instead of, for me, it means that instead of jumping into let's do this, we problematize uh, the challenge a lot, which is really good. But I'm really curious about what folks would do in this case. 
what type of methods would be used in this case. There's no scape. We can also start calling some names. Yeah. Calling, Alisa, um, I'm calling Alisa friend wise. I'm curious about your thoughts. Um, sure. So, so R Roberto and I talk, I actually have a couple of slides with my thoughts and reflections on the design task. Um, I was going to share them after, but why don't we do that in reverse? I'll share my thoughts and then maybe people will have more things to say. <laughs> Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I'm in limited tech today, so I'm not going to project the slides, but hopefully they're big enough. Can you see the one that says some reflections? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I think some of this follows on some of the comments that Fabio and uh, Ishan were, were making. Um, one of the things that I noticed that the first question where everyone was talking about what is that it was really easy to sort of start talking about what were the goals for the design versus what are the goals for the design process. And there's this sort of very hard stepping out of things uh, to do and say, you know, I mean, certainly I mentioned this down below, but of course, as designers, you're going to have goals for the process. And for many of you, the first goal was let's figure out if engagement is the right thing. And other people took a, a step back and said, well, it's not even if we should decide if engagement is the right thing, but maybe, you know, what is engagement or what are the real pain points? And then at least one group was talking about, let's understand what the user goals and desired outcomes are. Um, so I thought that that was very interesting because there was multiple levels of sort of saying, you know, okay, what's our goal for how to measure engagement? Oh, maybe we should question if engagement is the right thing to measure. But if you think about goals of the design process, you could also go a whole level more meta and say, you know, my goals for the design process are to build trust with users so when I roll this thing out, eventually they want to use it. And I think one, one group kind of alluded to that. And you could also imagine that in your design process, my goal is to make sure I understand my users' needs. So just pointing out that there's different levels that that question could be addressed on. Um, for the who question, I mean, all the usual suspects showed up, teachers, students, administrators. But one thing that popped into my mind, and this is based on some of the, the work that JP did, is um, I think it's really important to start to think about which ones, right? All students are not the same. We know that. And so, you know, which groups of students do we want to think about? And which groups of instructors? Are we thinking about different backgrounds, different disciplines? Um, I know this is farther than you might get in this current design task, but I think these are important um, and not easy questions. Uh, the other thing is that I think everybody did take sort of as granted that this notion of engagement was kind of agnostic to what was being learned, which I thought was interesting. And that was something, you know, can we build one tool to meet all needs is, is another question. And a couple of groups uh, brought up some interesting things. One group mentioned some of the who might be ethical or data um, privacy bodies or maybe the student union. And I think we think about who we tend to think about individuals. And I think about thinking about who at the level of the group was also really interesting. And that could be also a way to start to think about um, sampling, right? You could think about who is this different, you know, you've got the first generation students association, or you've got students who are interested in this or that. And, you know, those might also be ways to build up some of the trust for eventual rollout. And then uh, the last point here was there was a really interesting tension one group brought up, you know, we think of personas as this great way to be really user centered, we're going to build personas based on people. But someone, you know, one group pointed out that personas might be sort of this oversimplified way we see people versus letting them speak for themselves. And I think that's, I thought that was an interesting tension to highlight. Um, so tensions, <laughs> um, how do you do, I, I don't know if anyone group did dug into this much, but how do you deal with getting real meaningful engagement with people versus the fact you've got to get things done? A lot of the processes read as a little designer centric to me. On the other hand, as someone who's done this, I understand very well, you got to build something and sitting and talking with users all the time, right? They're not going to build it for you. And so, you know, I wondered whether a designer centric process maybe is a necessity and feel free to push back against this. And I think someone mentioned, you know, what about the constant critique? Users don't always know what they want and what they need. 
Um, that might be even more true to think about in a case where they don't know what's possible with data. Um, both like they can't imagine what really could be done and also they're imagining things that can't be done. And I know JP's done some work about how do you sort of do quick education to help people engage with you. Um, I thought theory was another interesting one. Obviously that was a seated question by the organizers. Um, I thought there was um, a lot of different theories listed at every different level from things that were very, very micro to sort of behaviorism, cognitive theory, constructivism, and social cultural, which I think everything we cover in uh, a learning analytics theory class that I teach. And so my question is, okay, how do we decide what to apply when? And how do you balance theory driven, which is by definition incredibly top down with this idea of a people based bottom up approach? I think that's a tension that we haven't, you know, if we've got a really theoretically motivated design and the users want something different, like that, that creates another tension. Um, last couple of thoughts, product versus product focus, product versus process focus are, is the goal of this process to build an object or is it thinking about an ongoing process? There was one group that sort of talked about building something, rolling it out, um, revising it, creating ongoing iteration with a, a user advisory group, and then thinking about how they're going to going to get people to use the thing. And so I, I thought that was a little broader perspective that was interesting to bring into it, thinking about not just user-centered design or human-centered design, but human-centered life cycles. Um, and then not something that was asked, but a question to all, how would you evaluate the success of your design process? Not the design, the design process. And I think that's an interesting question and in thinking, you know, at the end of it, do you feel, you know, do you think that learners felt like their voice was heard or do learners trust this is in their best intention there's a different set besides just the goals for the design that we might think about you know what would be the criteria or the roi so that's just a selection of things and maybe people uh they're provocative enough that people will have more things they want to say now Or not. Can I just thank Lisa for that super powerful summary? I think uh, that was incredibly insightful. Yeah, um, in a face-to-face -face workshop, usually I like to panelize with uh, round robin for everyone to to say some words, uh, let's let's try to do that. Um, you know, you know how many volunteers. Um, so yeah, let's just start. I'm just gonna point the first person um, in my in my uh, screen. The next person, which is Rebecca. Um, so yeah, so then we go one by one, and and everyone has a, a small slot to to just talk about the reflections about if, if you want to be to talk about the workshop or particular about this reflection the summary that I just put, put together that would be awesome so um Rebecca uh okay um I think I guess a little bit of reflection I suppose on the task I think it created certainly in our group a lot of areas for discussion and problematization which was really nice I think we didn't necessarily get all the way through a plan but I think we kind of agreed as well that actually that maybe wasn't a bad thing that actually having those discussions and debates was potentially as interesting um and I think yeah I think Alyssa raised quite a few interesting comments I think in our group there was I think we spent a long time problematizing and I think we spent some time thinking about what that end design might look like in our rejection of dashboards as well, which potentially was us making design decisions and actually maybe that's what teachers would have wanted potentially, I think. Um, I think I'm going away from this as an HCI person going, well, yeah, like the complexities of HCI as they intersect with learning analytics just seem to open up even more questions than there potentially are in solely HCI practices. Because I think there are so many more stakeholders and potential issues in there than maybe there are in other HCI domains. Maybe that's just because I'm within education, I can see the complexities maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's probably what I've got to say. I'm also gonna say it's 20 to three in the morning here and I've, about lost the ability to string a sentence together. Um, 
I'm too old for 3 a.m. awake, I think now. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I can I can have some reflections yeah. if okay uh, so um, it was really fascinating like to be uh, in a group also with a diverse like expertise and um, I realized have how, how I, I come for example from an educational background so um, it, it really differs the perspectives even in the design process like with having different expertise and I feel with designing such uh, tools and learning analytics it's really very important to have all these diverse perspectives uh, in order for it like to be uh, launched. Um, one idea that Dr. Um, Elissa mentioned about the user personas and the pushback. So I actually used user personas and I was very much fascinated by them. Like I was in love with them. So I, I, uh, I dealt so much into um, uh, looking into patterns. I talked, I interviewed several uh, instructors and then I looked into the literature. I found some patterns. And if it were to be like asking personas to talk for themselves, I don't think I would have uh, uh, looked at, like I wouldn't have had all this in-depth patterns and realizing that, uh, for example, in this college, let's say people are either um, like it's not labeling them, but it's like they have those types of traits, I would say. And uh, I can at, at, uh, at least uh, speak to my experience in that because I tried it the other way where I first like uh, tried to ask people to speak for themselves and this is what they did. But then everybody, like you cannot generalize anything if it's like one person speaking. Um, there will be so many uh, confounding things, I would say. So yeah, that was my perspective. Can I ask how you created the user personas? Because I think a lot of the critiques I've seen about them is when like students come in and say, mm, well, now I am, you know, a black man and I can make assumptions about what they need in this specific design space or whoever it is. Like I am clearly not. And then I'm putting my bias in the persona. You know, like that's like the critique I've seen as far as like making assumptions about a group that you don't actually identify with when you're, mm -hmm you know, trying to go through the design through their eyes, I guess. So I'm curious how you created yours and mitigated some of that. Yeah, thank you for the product. Product. So the first thing, uh, uh, first thing that I did was uh, we ran a needs analysis. So it's a project about like, it's a human centered design approach with uh, instructors to build dashboards uh, to engage students. <laughs> so the design challenge was perfect actually. But um, so uh, the first thing we did was we uh, ran a needs analysis on instructors and 63 instructors participated. And we asked them questions about what is what do they believe, uh, what is active learning from their perspective, how to engage students, uh, what uh, type of strategies do they use, etc. It was like very much also open-ended questions. And then we followed up with semi-structured interviews with uh, 10 instructors. And then after that, um, I did um, uh, I, I did find some patterns, and I realized that there was different profiling. So I asked for another follow up, like uh, a second interview with uh, six uh, more instructors that I identified as like profiling, and um, I went back to the literature and read more about active learning, and I kind of. Um, identify the personas based on the uh, content analysis and thematic analysis from the interviews that I did. So um, kind of uh, to, to, to square the circle and to bring some of the, what, what Lou was saying, you know, um, in, in qualitative research, right, um, one methodology that we have sometimes is to do member checking. So uh, presenting those personas to the very people that are supposed to be represented, or sometimes, um, you know, one thing that we did with Fabio um, uh, was to actually co-create the personas with, you know, with the people that were being represented. So the personas, it's like, it was like, it was students building personas of students like themselves that um, had, you know, some of the characteristics that they had, or some of the characteristics that they could see other students like themselves had. Yeah, also I ask another question here. Does, I mean, uh, how many personas do you have? Are they all uh, like underprivileged or underrepresented uh, students? 
or stakeholders or are you I mean my question here is that how did the, how does the design look like when you only think about those underrepresented uh, users rather than having like a broader like a range of users or are you like the are you can do you consider all these like a different users or are you or do you fo mainly focusing on these users that you talked about um, yeah, I see in the chat, Isabel, I think, is uh, talking more about goal-driven. I think our personas were not demographically driven at all. So the whole idea of the dashboard is to, um, to um, uh, like, allow instructors to look at their active learning strategies and ways to engage students. So I was looking at personas from this goal perspective, and I was looking at how do uh, instructors really implement active learning strategies in their uh, courses. And that's how like the personas were, for example, there is the mover. And based on this persona, the features of the dashboard might differ because they are more interested in X, Y, and Z versus another person who does active learning in a different way. That makes sense. I'm looking forward to see if using the persona could uh, partially reduce the bias um, in the visualizations uh, and the algorithms under, underlying uh, the, the learning uh, management system and its learning analytic tools. Because uh, one of the rationale for persona to improve that is that it reduces um, how the algorithm will perce uh, perceive the students' groups. Uh, like there are a lot of like minority groups uh, are reported as being biased um, towards the poor performance um, against the other more majority groups. And I think that uh, might be a good, in uh, interesting um, topics to work about. So I'd like to share some of my reflections. Um, I feel like I've like going through this workshop. I've been going from like uh, ha include having using my assumptions to think about how the tool will be look like to something that I realize I don't know anything about what students need and what instructor needs. So this uh, kind of losing a little bit uh, efficacy as a researcher to uh, being part of the. Uh, tool design or uh, implementation uh, uh, process, but uh, and also I realized that there are there are assumptions that we have that we might never be able to realize that are biased or not true, uh, since we are not the ones who are who are the who are going to use the tool. For instance, I've never experienced being uh, notched by a. a algorithm not telling me that I'm, not, I'm being quiet, not be able to respond. But that's my first time I experienced that. And that gives me a lot of like, I'm, I was, I had an immediate emotion uh, reacting, emotional reaction to that uh, when I saw that message. And I've never had that before. Uh, when I think about how to design student facing dashboard, I feel without including the stakeholders in the conversation, it's really hard to understand how they would react to this. And I, I also feel like uh, the, the the activity that having us going through a design process is helping us to anticipate the challenges and try our best to uh, to prepare for those challenges. I know that we won't be able to ad address everything, but at least we we were designing a process that attempt to identify the challenges and trying to alleviate some of the challenges. So, this. Oh, oops. Thanks. So, so I came to this uh, workshop um, to learn what is human-centered learning analytics as a, an outsider. And I still don't have uh, the correct answer. I don't know how I will uh, score on a quiz if you give me one. Um, 
so far, my impression is that um, human-centered, my takeaway from uh, the task that I did with my team members is that, first of all, human-centered learning analytics is about embracing the complexity of actual human beings, uh, including more and more complex um, or, or diverse factors. Like previously, we thought about students as this abstract person that learns or not, and then we started, they, they were engaged or not, and then we realized that they have actually they have feelings. How amazing. Um, and so to, to have this, and, and then we realized that they can come from uh, very different backgrounds and cultural backgrounds and, 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 and social economic backgrounds and adding increasingly adding complexity, layers and layers of complexity onto it to the extent that during our discussion, we fe felt that every word we say, the definition of which is worth several PhD theses. Um, <laughs> and it is, uh, it, it's the other thing, the other takeaway is that I'm talking to um, human centered uh, learning analytics involves talking to actual humans before, a lot of talking to actual humans before actually developing um, anything which I think is uh, an, an excellent direction of the entire, of the entire uh, field because I remember um, a couple of, uh, several years back when MOOCs first came out, the developers would just throw different kinds of toys and, 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 and we rarely get an opportunity to talk to, uh, to them about what they're developing. Um, yeah, uh, so, that's my, oh, and then lastly, he, the more complex the student model is, the more expensive it gets. Our group discussion ended up uh, being, you know, whether we ask for more time or ask for a lot more money. <laughs> so that is another takeaway. Um, and I hope Zoom Sensor is not going to say that I'm too quiet anymore. Yeah, this is my first year to came to uh, the HCD workshop. Uh, this year I came to explore how to prototype uh, human-centered design in learning analytics. I found a lot of uh, interesting uh, directions to go after this uh, workshop. One takeaway is that uh, the design phases in uh, the human-centered design involves a lot of uh, stakeholders and a participant uh, part participation of those uh, various stakeholders are really co um, correlated to each other. And I found that uh, the notion that start out small and growing big is a very uh, important notion for a human centered design. We can't like start um, with a very uh, a lofty um, vision and complete the um, the design uh, totally holistically in just one deployment. We need to do it step by step, and by doing those steps, uh, we are kind of um, developing the wisdom of how to start from smaller, uh, like trying with some uh, few courses, uh, like big courses from uh, the first or second year, and then to expand uh, those uh, design systems uh, to a wider communities um, and stakeholders uh, by imparting uh, them with the skill set of how to use and learn from uh, the learning analytics systems. And from the design purposes, I learned uh, the importance of design justice and uh, how to reduce the uh, bias um, that um, towards against uh, those uh, underrepresented students. And I also uh, saw the uh, opportunity to extend uh, this human design um, into the MOOC settings where uh, it is the asynchronous educational platforms. I think uh, that um, the MOOCs on dashboard is left to be um, designed in the, you know, in a scale like uh, today's uh, workshop, we have discussed uh, about the deepness depth of the design. So, uh, it's worth a lot. Uh, it's worth various uh, research directions and papers to go in a uh, future few years to 
actualize uh, those prototypings and uh, the practice of those um, human-centered uh, design in learning analytic evaluation phase in uh, the MOOCs. That's very interesting. I think I need to um, propose this idea to my lab as well. So I've started typing this, but maybe I'll just say it. I'm really, I was really interested in a bunch of people's reactions to the Zoom sensors. Like, I too was told I was really quiet in my group, and that I think I was a little bit quiet, but like there were sort of reasons for that that weren't necessarily explored. But I kind of, I wonder if there's some really interesting potential HCL explorations within that in sort of empathy the explorations of designers and how it really feels to have those tools in with you because I think maybe that's not that's not something I'd thought about exploring but it's something that seems to have come up quite a lot from quite a few people who've had some interesting reactions to the zoom sense of prompting them um but yeah we'll just... yeah yeah um yeah, thanks so much also for your impression. I wanted to have a longer chat about some sense, um, but I just left in the chat um, a link to that project. It was created by, not by us, but by some colleagues that we are trying to use it in education and in co-design uh, tools for teachers. And, and now we learned that also for students because we hadn't worked with the, with the prompt yet. Um, but anyway, that's another conversation. If anyone is interested, just drop us an email uh, and it's also open source. But let's wrap up the workshop. We have extra two minutes and I just wanted to, to say thank you. I think um, from our perspective, the workshop was really productive. Lots of ideas were generated. We recorded uh, the sessions. We are going to clean up the recording and then share it with you. We're not going to do the the main session with, uh, when everyone went to breakout rooms because that's going to be boring. I used to see myself going and jumping from one room to the other. But I think um, from all the reflections um, that we all learned a lot today, um, it was really nice to, to share different resources. Um, and one of the potential next steps that we didn't have a chance to talk about is maybe propose this as a, as a special interviews group. This is the first time that we organize this workshop. And um, it was short uh, because it was online, so we tried to make it short, but we are thinking about running another one that works um, for other time zones, like Europe, for Europe was really bad. So maybe there is a chance to run it again in EasyTel if the deadline is still on. So if anyone is interested in being part of, the, of this small community that we are creating, feel free to send an email to any one of us and of the organizers. And we're going to try to um, organize ourselves into a bigger group if, if anyone is interested. Um, and organize, if not for a, another conference for LAC next year, definitely that would be a, a nice plan. So um, yeah, if anyone has any last minute comment, probably put in the chat and we copy and we follow it up later on. So yeah, thank you very much to everyone and especially to the warriors in time zones where Probably you should be sleeping, have a good rest. And yeah, thank you. See you around. Thank you all. Nice meeting you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Right. <laughs> I was scared. Wait a minute. There's nothing else, right? That happened at the end of the yeah. workshop. <laughs> <laughs> No, usually we would be like, let's, let's no, have a drink. There's no like planning happy hour now. That's what I keep waiting for. <laughs> like something fun. Oh, hopefully <laughs> next year when fun. we are. <laughs>